<laughs> All righty. Welcome on, ladies. I am super excited to announce this special guest that we have on today, Marty Wilson. And Marty is from Australia. How are you doing, Marty? Hello. I'm really good. Thank you. I'm so happy to be on here. Yeah, it's a pleasure having you here. So Marty did a PhD in everyday sexual coercion and consent. And uh, she has a wealth of knowledge on this topic. And so today we're going to be going into some of the lines that I hear women say in affair dynamics all the time on repeat. We've got a list of lines that we hear and Marty's going to unpack them with us together today. Marty, can you, before we go into all of this, can you tell us a bit about your expertise and your background and where you've been on this journey? Yeah, for sure. So basically I started with looking into sexual coercion out of my own personal interest, I suppose, when I was younger and would have, you know, sexual interactions with um, with men and that feeling of like pressure and persistence being normalized. So, you know, you've, you know, just say it's on like a date or a, or a night out or something like that. And there's some sort of offer to go home with him or, you know, something like that. And you decline that. And then it's the chipping away at your boundaries. And I just experienced it so many times and, and oftentimes it would result in then something happening that the next day I would feel like a sense of guilt about as though like I failed myself or like I did something um, like I, I had, I was weak or I let myself down in some way. And I just started to, you know, look into that feeling um, and got to a point where I, I was like, this is actually really wrong that this is so normalized. So that's what brought about my own interest in sexual coercion and I was studying at uni at the time and I went on to do honours and then a PhD. So I did that as my as my major topic. And um, alongside that, I work uh, for a domestic violence organisation. So I work with women who are victim survivors of abusive relationships. So I think those two things pair really well. And I also run women's groups um, for victim survivors of domestic abuse. And we talk a lot about coercive control. So the way that abuse occurs in relationships that, you know, doesn't necessarily have to include physical violence. It can, but a lot of the time it's that, yeah, again, that persistent control, that that pattern of behaviour um, in which one person kind of erodes the uh, the other's ability to self-determine or like have autonomy in their own life. So they're kind of my areas of interest and they, they marry together pretty well. Yeah, incredible, amazing. And Marty has so many resources, which we'll go into further at the end of the discussion, because um, I'm sure you'll love everything that she has to say and learn a lot through this um, video today. And she has a po podcast and everything like that you, that you can access at the end of the call. Yes. So um, Marty, today we're going to go into, we're, we're talking about affair dynamics today, specifically when you are in a relationship with a married man um, and the signs of sexual coercion and lack of consent in those kind of relationships and how do we really spot it because when mm. we when, when we don't know what to look for we we have this feeling but there's no words or understanding to why we're feeling that feeling mm -hmm. um so I've got a list um I'm just gonna like so say uh share some of the things that he says the married man says and mm -hmm. also the things that she says so yourself not you Marty but the mm -hmm. listener in this situation things that she says if she is in an affair dynamic with a married man um and we're going to unpack the feelings behind it mm -hmm. so um the first one I've got is you look so good I can't keep my hands off you mm. and I suppose like th so yeah this is such a big theme in any, any sexual coercion around like setting up the other person as as kind of yeah responsible for what's happening or as having created what happened like you dressed so you are so sexy or you're so hot or you've dressed in that dress or in that way so therefore how could I be assumed or like uh, expected to control myself mm -hmm. uh, and it plays into these kind of like stereotypes around men's sexuality that permeate actually through society um in a very 
very entrenched way. So if you think of like, well, what did she expect? Or boys will be boys. Like these types of narratives that we have around how men have these uncontrollable sex drives and how and how it's actually women's responsibility. And like, obviously we're talking in a heterosexual context, you know, here, um, women's responsibility to um, protect from like these uncontrollable sex drives that men just naturally have, which is not true. I, I, as in like it's genuinely debunked um, that there, that, of course, it's actually sex drives differ person to person. There are men with low sex drives. There are women with really high sex drives. Everybody has differences depending on their own experiences, hormonal makeup, all of that kind of thing. It is not a gendered thing. But because we give like this almost permission because of societal narratives to men to act as though their sex drives are like driving them, that then they can say things like that and they can position women as responsible for their sexual gratification as in like, well, you've turned me on and like, what am I supposed to do? I'm just a mere slave to my <laughs> to my sex drive. <laughs> so I think that those types of, um, you know, you look so good, um, you know, what am I supposed to do now? Like whatever, those types of comments really play into that. And they also, they also do something which comes into like my tactics in my PhD around like I kind of, um, what you call it, broke down the ways that sexual coercion usually occurs into point by point tactics. And one of them, um, so there's a bigger, uh, group of verbal coercion but one of them is like sycophancy which is like compliments um and when you give somebody a compliment there's also something in that that creates an expectation or um expectations the right word creates a almost like you've done a favor like you're given something nice you now need to give something back like mm. if he said something nasty to you um in that it would be less enticing but when it's like a compliment and you feel like oh well, he's being nice to me maybe I do owe him something like that's kind of, and especially when it happens over and over and over again. Yeah. Which will go more um, throughout the podcast into the impacts of repetition as well. Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. So amazing. Thank you so much for sharing. And just like, as you hear Marty speak, notice like what goes on in your body. Cause I know for sure when you were saying like men just have high sex drives and then Mm. you saying that that's not true, my body like felt resistance. I was like, yeah, but Mm. it is. Um, because you have like society's conditioning is just all over you so um yeah it's just interesting totally. feeling what responds in your body when hearing these different ways of thinking yeah so thank you yeah um the next one is my wife my wife doesn't get it I just need your support right now yes so again I think this one is like setting her up as responsible for his emotional state in that like he needs support and he's got to get that from someone else like (laughs) a woman has to give me the support like I'm not going to be able to soothe myself I'm not going to be able to regulate my own emotions I need some like external person to support me um but also the thing of like my wife's not going to get it again and this is actually what we call benevolent sexism it's actually like an underhanded compliment as in to accept that compliment of like, oh, we have a special connection, I get it, and his wife doesn't. It's actually then having to essentially put down another woman. Like it's kind of like when, um, you know, I've been out on nights out and guys say, oh, you're so cool and easy to talk to, not like other girls. And you've got to be able to 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 accept that compliment of like, oh, I'm special and I'm I'm easy to talk to and funny and like all these things, which so many women are it's again not a gendered thing but to the way that it is set up because of narratives and stereotypes about like oh you know men are so funny and have so much personality but women don't complete lie but um that that actually plays into like what you said before like it permeates all of our understandings of the world and so when someone says that to you particularly when I was younger and I and I wasn't aware I would think oh that's great that's what I want I want to be different from other girls that are less cool and funny and whatever and so I want to receive this compliment and that makes me a bit more like one of the boys or more like attractive to boys and that then plays into a whole nother thing around like the valuing of masculinity or quote-unquote masculine traits and the devaluing of femininity and feminine traits in the world that's almost like another conversation 
but yes, that um, backhanded compliment in a way, um, which the reason it's called benevolent sexism, it's like it's like when someone says, oh, you're so good at your job for a woman. Um, yeah, it's like to accept that compliment, you've got to be a kind of in a way agreeing that women are generally bad at their job. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So he's I... kind of, oh, sorry. No, continue. Oh, he's just basically saying like, yeah, my wife isn't able to support me in this because she doesn't get it. So there's like some flaw he's, you know, setting up as in, in her, but you get it. And so, oh, wow, to feel this special, like, you know, feeling, I have to accept that it's okay for him to say that about his wife. Which, yeah. yeah. Mm. I think there's also um, just talking on backhand compliments, mm. um, they can really set you up for how you should be in the relationship. Mm-hmm. And uh, just another kind of um, phrase that's coming to my mind is something like um, something around comparing you to the wife in regards to don't be like the wife or I won't like you either kind mm-hmm. of thing. Um, and like something like um, I like the way that you wear short skirts. My wife mm-hmm. is always dressing in like older clothes or I like the way that you never get angry. My wife is mm-hmm. always challenging me and like talking back and everything like that. And it's like pretty much saying that you shouldn't do yes. those things. So can you tell me, tell us more about that? That's a fantastic point. And um, I think, what that would do and so like something else I'm kind of gathering from um having been thinking about this up like in the lead up to doing this having this chat with you is you know a lot of the time what makes coercion effective is when there's some degree of interest so like if you are absolutely uninterested in that person um a lot of the things that they try and coerce you with wouldn't really necessarily be as effective unless they've also got an an exploitation of power like they're your boss or they have some sort of insider knowledge about your life that they could expose or something like that but there's usually got to be something but a lot of the time I would expect there's at least some degree of attraction to them right like there's or like something like that yeah Um, and so when you have that but you might not actually then want to you either you've either had there's been an affair and then you've decided to step away from that or there hasn't been one yet and he's trying to, you know, coerce you into getting to that point, um, whichever, whatever kind of way it goes. If you have had or do have attraction or interest in their looks or personality or the way they treat you or whatever, there's often, there's that, there's that desire to impress and that desire to be liked And that is a massive, a massive part that plays into a lot of coercion because we don't want to, like, if we're wanting to be looked upon favorably by somebody, we're really careful about how we respond to things and how we act so as we can kind of like almost like keep in their good books. And again, especially complicated if they have some other sort of role in your life, like a colleague or a boss or something like that, or they're in your industry. And so like with that comparison to the to their wife and if that's something that's like a continued theme and particularly that like, oh, because you don't get angry and she gets angry, that is, as you said, it's basically setting up like a standard of therefore you feeling as though if you're to ever get angry, you're not going to impress him anymore and you're going to be put in the category as what he has the way he now he speaks about his wife now or the way that he obviously treats his wife or whatever and if you're not you're wanting to avoid that um it's more likely that you will modify your own behavior so as to try and keep impressing him and keeping in his good books and this is a part of coercive control like in abusive relationships a lot of the time as well like it's it's not just a part of sexual coercion so it kind of comes into a lot of the different ways that coercion affects relationships in all different contexts um, and it's it's very limiting because it's, it's all it's it's actually very it's very manipulative and very clever for them because they're setting up a situation in which they basically uh, can't be held accountable or can't be um, yeah like cr- criticized or, or admonished for whatever they do because then you'll just be like oh I thought you weren't like that I thought we had this different relationship and so yeah if you're wanting to keep that. Yeah, that's what I guess comes to mind for me. 
Absolutely. It's so powerful. And I think so many women would be able to be having so many like, oh my God, that's me moments mm-hmm. right now. Mm-hmm. Um, so let's continue. Um, I've, I've got some he, shares, he says and she says. I might go into some she says just so we're not all talking about mm-hmm. what he's saying. So this is a few of these are how um, the other women, um, the listeners are feeling. Um, uh, I didn't want to rock the boat, especially because he's going through a lot right now. Um, mm-hmm. This could be in either wanting um, a committed relationship that's not in the fair dynamic, or this could be in wanting to break off the affair, but also feeling like, oh my gosh, he is going through so much. A lot of them are business, re- I mean, work-based relationships. Mm. So it could be like, oh, there's heaps of pressure at work right now. I don't want to put mm. even more pressure on him. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah. And I mean, this one to me, um, it speaks to like, so there's something within uh, coercive control that is like it's like a, a part of the pattern of course of control where the person who is attempting to be the, the person in control of the relationship or to control the other person, they will set up a situation in which like the lens of the relationship, so the way that the relationship is looked at is kind of through like his lens um, as opposed to equally through both people's lenses. Um, and I think like you know, with a lot of the comments that you, you know, that you read out of what he said, it's that actively him trying to situate things as being looked at through his lens um, so that she can see like, you know, oh, but he needs this right now. Oh, he thinks that like I should be like this. So, and he wants this, you know. And then in this one, I can see actually then the, the, the effect that has of, especially because he was going through a lot, like she's actually seeing like his needs or what he's going through as actually kind of like the priority mm. um, perhaps. And and that I didn't want to rock the boat as well. Like I think that that, that comes, you know, that re- can relate to so many things, but like, you know, if, if he's set up like, oh, it just would make my life so it would, you know it would it's just not the right time or it would make my life so much harder or whatever it might be because I can imagine if if he's given any um yeah like breadcrumbs around perhaps leaving his wife or something like that and then it's like well when's that going to happen or is that going to happen and it's like oh now it's just not the right time for example you know um and then it's like oh I didn't want to rock the boat I just wanted to kind of like give him the space that he needs. So just kind of following in that narrative of like everything kind of being. Pulling on his needs. Yeah. And just from his perspective and it's that kind of double standard is like, I would be, you know, questioning like, well, when, when is it that like your needs are being met in a way that are, that is like genuine. Yeah. Not, not maybe just something like, um, I guess the placations that he might give when you're feeling like your needs aren't being met and he says, oh, well, they will be, or, oh, let me do this for you or something like that. But like, actually, how long are we going along on like his agenda? That's what I would be kind of wondering. Um, But yeah, and I think, I think that's just a, I think that's just a perfectly normal response to all of those different like things of, coercive sentiments that has probably happened over the time to the point that she's actually like I am actually seeing things from his perspective because he has he's manipulated the situation so that I do and like you know you might not be aware that that's what's happening but I think it's like it's yeah it's really it's effective manipulation is effective um and that's just a result of it which is totally like understandable yeah and if you are in this affair dynamic right now, really notice how much you're considering your actions and the steps and your wants through the lens of his, as opposed to what you really need and what's going to make you feel seen, safe, um, mm. and happy in a relationship. Mm. Um, another like one that just like immediately comes up when we say double standard of needs is, um, so obviously these women are single 
um it's a relationship with a married man that is in secret Mm -hmm. um so some of the women do like go well either I need to date so I'm I'm not like fully consumed by this experience or you're not fully committed to me so like of course like I am like I'm Mm -hmm. able to date and stuff but then and there's there's often communication like from the other man uh, from the married man like yeah go date or whatever do what you want to do but then as soon as they do start doing that it's like either don't date that person he's bad for you or Mm -hmm. um no like uh just like this uh real aggression that comes out when they do start Mm -hmm. dating yeah so they've got like they they may be like aware enough to understand that like it would be a really big double standard if they were to explicitly say you can't date anyone else and then so they're like yeah go for it and then they'll find a reason to make a problem out of whichever the person she chooses or the jealousy that that they feel um they don't regulate that themselves um because like jealousy is a is a, a natural emotion that can occur it's how we uh, express that jealousy or how we um, process that feeling of jealousy is what becomes like a, a problem in a lot of in a lot of relationships so when we um, make the other person feel like they're responsible to soothe our jealousy um, particularly if it's uh, unreasonable which in this case it would be if she's you know having to consistently um, know that he's actually in an he has a family or a, or a wife or whatever another relationship and that she can never have that full, you know, part of him or the, the all of him. Uh, if she's having to consistently know that and kind of like be okay with it, at least on some level. Um, and then he, like, you know, to have have any sort of equality in that, he would need to be totally also accepting and fine of whatever other relationships she has. Yeah. And so if he is becoming like hostile, um, aggressive whatever way he's expressing his jealousy in an unhealthy way um that to me is is control that's control and that's and that's a massive it's a massive double standard and it's it, again it points to me of um a, a him truly having a belief that yeah there's one set of rules for him and another set of rules for for her and that that, that within him there is actually some sort of yeah uh, acceptance of that as like the way things should be in these types of situations and like that kind of ties back to you know narratives we have about men and women like gender and sex and things like that just in in the world we live in a patriarchal society and you know men do uh have had and still continue to have like many more um positions of power or like they've often been in situations where like they're considered the head of the house or like the you know the person who makes the decisions for the family and things like that, like if, yeah, it calls the shots. And so, so if we kind of put that mentality into then these other situations, you can see where they might get this sense of entitlement that they get to make the decisions of how this will go and that they get to essentially make consequences for someone for, even if it's not explicitly making a consequence, like getting aggressive or angry about that is a consequence. They're punishing her for doing that thing. Yeah. Um, going on a date or seeing someone else or whatever. And, um, yeah, I guess, yeah, I, I like had another thought a moment ago, but I can't remember what it is right now, so maybe it'll come back to me. <laughs> it might come back in another question. Yeah. Um, beautiful. Um, uh, this one, this one is, so again, a lot of them are the workplace. Um, and this is what can make it really difficult to end the affair is because you've got your job and you've got this uh, intimate relationship with someone mm. that you obviously really care about. Um, and so when it ultimately is ca- causing more pain, pain than pleasure and mm. that cycle goes on for ages until you can't stand pain um, anymore. So one of the uh, phrases from him is, you're not going to find anything better than this. Like one, we have an intimate relationship and even just taking away the intimacy, if we can try to take the intimacy away, Mm. speaking from his words, I care for you more than anyone. I know Mm. you more than anyone. I know you intimately, even if we stop the intimacy. So Mm. you just going into another job is one, they're not going to like, 
care for you in the same way. You're just going to be an employee. They're just going to want to pay you and get your job done. It's like, if you leave, you're not going to get anything better kind of thing. Mm. I mean, and I think uh, this plays into, into fears that we have about ourselves. So like, you know, if we are like in, in any relationship that I've ever been in, when I'm considering like leaving that person, I will feel that like, what if, what if I don't meet someone that likes me as much as this or that I like as much as that? Like it's it's a really normal fear to have. And I think that this kind of statement from him is playing into that fear or like feeding that fear. And what I would kind of say to that is like, like as in, I'm not meaning as in directly to him, although I mean you could, but like as in what I would respond to that with to you is like, sorry, you don't think that, other people can see my value or my like spark or like the what what it has been that like has attracted you to me or like the things that I bring like so what you're saying that like there's no one else that's going to recognize like my talent or my you know like and and I guess that's something that that they can really um probably make you feel that which completely lowers your like is wearing away your self-worth that's right and like a lot of like coercion particularly when we look at coercive control in like a relationship setting a lot of it does begin with that like chipping away at self-worth and things like that because and it comes back to like isolation like if if someone can isolate the person that they're trying to like you know at the end of the day these guys are basically saying hey I want to have an extra relationship with you on my terms and so for they're aware on some level that it's dependent on you um, like agreeing to abiding that. Abiding to that agreement. Yeah, abiding to that, yeah. And so like they are going to try and make it um, unappealing for you to walk away because, of course, like you do have the power. I mean, sometimes you don't understand like threats and things like that really, really affect that. But as in, you know, it, generally that you could go, actually, no, this isn't for me. I don't want to be with someone that's in a, in a, in a marriage and that's really reasonable. So um I think that because they know that they find these other manipulative ways to chip at your self-esteem and self-worth um, sense of self so that you are more likely to stay with them fearing that, that you don't have other options. Mm. And that, um, yeah, that that's like, it's, yeah, it, it's, it's playing on a fear. It's isolating you from potential other options whether that's another relationship or another job or whatever to keep you in this situation that actually is just benefiting them quite a lot right now and that they don't want to lose yeah Yeah. and that's I think that's the pain that a lot of women feel is when they do start getting intimate with him and they have hopes for something more and then realize that that's not actually going to evolve in that way Mm. this feeling that he will literally just go back to his wife or mm-hmm. another phrase I've got here somewhere is like, if you're not going to do it with me, I'm just going to go to someone else. Mm. Like, um, and it really hurts. Yeah. And that to me, that one's really um, demeaning, I would say, or like degrading because it's actually kind of like saying, which I think conflicts with then how they make you feel really cared for in other like moments, but like actually kind of like saying you're just one of like, there's more of you. There's more of you. I could, I could, I could. And I think that's why it cuts so deep because you're like, hang on. I thought we had a special connection. Like you say, we have this great connection. No one will care for you. Like I will. Da 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 da. And then now you're saying, well, if you don't do it, I will just find someone else who will. And that's, that's like, you could be replaced. Um, and that's a horrible thing to hear. Yeah. So I think looking at those kind of like um, contradictions in what they're saying as well in the way that they're coercing, like, you know, that they'll actually use this sentiment that actually contradicts with this other sentiment. But the other sentiment coercive. of like, I've never met anyone like you. We have the mm-hmm. strongest connection and things like that. Exactly. Exactly. And so saying like as well, saying that there's, that they'll just find somebody else. Um, it, it kind of links back with what we were talking about before of when you do have 
interest or desire for that person, even if you're ultimately like, it's for the best for me to end this or it's for the best for me to not get into this for whatever reason. Um, even if you have that, but you've also, it's like, you know, it's very rare that we are 100% like, you know, um, no about something like anything that we're doing we're often a bit indecisive or we're often a bit conflicted like we don't have to have a 100 percent no for our no to still be really meaningful and and our decision um yeah. so it can be like you know oh, like there's a part of me that really wants to sleep with that person or be with that person or whatever but there's also a part of me that really doesn't want to and I'm going to go with that because I feel like that's the best choice for me in the long run or whatever yeah and then you've given that refusal and um and they don't accept that and they start to chip away and then saying something like well if you won't someone else like somebody else will it's like yeah it's kind of like well if I want to still be receiving some of this like care or affection or like or I don't yeah or even just a feeling of like again feelings of jealousy of like oh my goodness well I, like I'll feel so like it will feel so horrible to then see him with somebody else. Um, all of those things can still go through your mind. And like, yeah, it, it's, it's, it's not that like you could still have a firm boundary, but it does try to, he's trying to erode it. Basically. He knows that that's going to erode it. That's what it comes down to. And then the pain of him ultimately stripping that all away um, or, or having that conflict can seem so much more than, the little temporary pain of like, okay, like if it's some intimacy or whatever it is mm. that he's, he's desiring and you also are desiring that connection, but you mm. might be desiring emotional connection um, at that yeah. time. And you might feel that the the pain of saying no is um, way outruns the just saying yes and, and having that connection on his terms. Yeah. Well, and a lot of women like, um, when I did my PhD and just generally that I've spoken to over the years and I, I would imagine it's the same kind of in this community um, is that sentiment of like it's just easier to give in um, in the moment a lot of the time especially like if the co coercion um, or like convincing or coaxing or whatever language you might use for it is repetitive and like continuous um, whether it's over that night or it's like a week or a month or whatever and then there's this like this point where it's like, oh, this isn't going to stop. Like I, I'm just going to get it over with. Um, or like this is so painful because the things and particularly like in this situation, they are actually using the relationship in that, that they you do have some sort of established connection or, you know, relationship there. They're using that in the coercion. So, yeah, making like doing saying things that will make you feel insecure and like there's a threat to. Um, your position in his life, etc. if you don't do X, Y, Z, which is kind of, it's also, again, like a contradiction from then if you think of the ways that maybe they might have coerced earlier on around like, oh, no, we don't have to, it doesn't have to be a sexual relationship. We could just, um, like, I just really, I just really want to be around you. Let's just spend time together, you know, like, and yeah. I think, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we can use, go into yeah. that one now because I think that would be powerful. Um, oh, cool. uh, just on the just what you're talking about before like another one that I have is um just gonna think of off my top of my head instead of finding it <laughs> but, <laughs> there. um it's yeah is something like well if you're not gonna participate in this then I'm not going to support you and helping you get that that position that raise or whatever you're wanting and and mm -hmm. he might have he might be your manager or have a high position of say in things um and so mm -hmm. it can feel like I don't know, you want that raise or you, mm -hmm. you were, mm -hmm. were like those career goals were really important to you. So yes. I feel like just going with it, going with the flow is also benefiting you, but mm -hmm. your whole body is saying no. Yeah. And it's interesting with that because like, of course, every situation is different, but I can imagine that like at the start, um, if that had been like a, something that had, <clears throat> that had lured like, you know, interest in the situation or there was, yeah, like there, that was perhaps a promise that was made earlier on or something like that. And then now that you're, say, trying to call it off or something, that then it's like, oh, well, you won't get that thing. And I can imagine that that would just be such a, 
like a it would be so rocking because it's like hang on but this was already like we had we had this relationship we have had this agreement or you know um and not to say that it was an explicit agreement but like it's it's like I mean at the end of the day it's a threat it's like you will not advance in your career in the way that you wanted to or you were expecting to if you aren't with me that's a threat like and it's it's an ultimatum and um yeah it's just it's just kind of like not only am I not going to benefit in a way that I thought I might but I'm actually going to be disadvantaged Mm, absolutely and it can Mm. keep you so tied Mm -hmm. um because you're holding on to those the the benefits of benefit they feel beneficial but not at the cost of your own happiness Mm -hmm. I think also where this coercion can or manipulation can come in is say you have entered the affair Mm -hmm. And then like a few weeks later, they contact you and they're like, I've spoken to so-and-so about your, the goals of like getting this position and they want to have an interview with you or something, Mm -hmm. um, or, or not even work, but something related of like, I got hold of, oh God, I'm so random with the like pictures that come into my mind, but that, that dream couch that you wanted, that was (laughs) the only one in Australia. Um, and you're like, oh, I wanted that. Do I... It is like it can totally be a way to slip back into the conversations and the connection. And I can imagine that there'd be times where then it's like, but if you say like, you know, if you've said, but no, but I don't want to keep doing this, like, like obviously I want that thing that you're, you know, kind of dangling with the carrot. The carrot. <laughs> but um, but but I've said like I, I don't want to keep doing this. And then I can imagine them being like, oh no, no, well, let's just meet up for a lunch or a dinner, like and let's just, you know, and getting kind of getting you back, like all I want is one dinner with you or something yeah. like that. And then it's like getting you back into their environment where you then, are, um, he knows you're going to be more vulnerable to then if he begins to coerce again then. 100%. And, that's, and then that leads to to more and it's kind of like, oh, it wasn't just a dinner, <laughs> you know. And mm. just like notice how much more vulnerable you are when you are in person. If you have broken it off, like if you mm. do entertain that in-person coffee of, yeah, we've had a 10-year friendship, like mm. you can't just cut it off. Mm-hmm. Um, we can't just, if we have to cut the sexual, it doesn't mm. mean we have to cut the friendship or something. Mm. Like let's just catch up. Immediately as you catch up, you're immediately vulnerable to yeah. leaning into them and to to having that care and affection that, you crave yeah yeah um I want to just touch on one that's like super subtle um uh, here's something like here why don't why don't you just have a shower relax I'll Mm -hmm. make you dinner maybe you've had a really stressful time or you've just been crying or something you have a shower relax and I'll make you dinner and we can just enjoy each other's company together Mm -hmm. yeah and like this is pretty much what like I was just thinking about um, with these last couple that we're talking about around setting up a situation in which it's positioned as like, yeah, not a sexual thing necessarily. Um, It might simply have intimacy as in like you're sharing space together and having dinner or whatever and there's that care element, but it's like um, there it's actually like, oh, I'm doing something for you. You have a shower, you're being stressed, you're upset, whatever, you relax, I'm going to make us dinner. It's kind of like, oh, like, you know, you need this, like, you know, this, um, you need to be cared for right now, Treatment. which is like what we want, like, you know, like so much of the time, like it's what people want. Um, I guess what happens is, and again, so this ties it back to like, societal narratives and stereotypes that um are myths but like around you know if a woman let's say if a woman goes to dinner with a man and he buys her dinner that she owes him something or he buys her a drink she owes him something he gives her a compliment she owes her something like these these aren't real these this isn't real we don't have to give a man or anyone our body our like sexual intimacy or anything our time of day we don't have to just because they do something nice for us But it is something that's set up and we have like so many labels for women um, who don't give something back when uh, they've had something done for them. And like, you know, a tease, she let him on. Um, uh, She's a like, yeah, there's all of those kind of labels. And they are to make us feel guilty for not holding up our end of the bargain, essentially. Yeah. And I think what 
like yeah to kind of keep in mind here is like everyone is aware of these and I think when men do this there is quite a degree of awareness of what they're doing because like um you'll hear like you know oh but but I've been buying you drinks all night or but I but we've come on this holiday like oh you've come home with me like you know like what did you expect to happen this is the only night that we have like away from his wife or whatever like in in two years (laughs) yeah and what I would say um with this is like he by doing that he's giving you something that of course is a normal thing to crave like that care and he's also lulling her into a false sense of security um in that like oh maybe tonight like you know or whatever like there is just this opportunity for me to be cared for and like you know, it is just, he is just being, this is that part of him that I love, you know, that's, this is just, this is just the, the sweetheart that I love. Um, and this is why I've had this like kind of ongoing thing with him because he just, he is so generous with, you know, whatever, whatever. There's always going to be every single person has good sides and can have problematic sides, all of that. But like, particularly when like in, like in an affair context, when, um, there's definitely would have been a time of like what you could either call say like grooming or you could call like the honeymoon Mm. period um, where it's like, he's showing you like the best parts of himself. And particularly if there's like um, lavish things, you know, if it's like, if he's got wealth, for example, like it might be like dinners or like, you know, gifts, things like that. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, But I bet it can also be just like, yeah, in listening to you or yeah, being there for you, whatever. And so, like, I would say that these offers of, like, have a shower, relax, I'll cook you dinner, they seem so lovely and generous and it's like, oh, yeah, okay, I want to accept that. And you should be able to accept that without owing something. But then what I would say, and, like, this is what's called often a bait and switch or, like, it's it's kind of in a different um, sector. It's like marketing actually bait and switch, but it can be transferred into this as in, it's like in marketing, it's like advertise as a product. And then it's a different product um, that they switch for in the end that isn't quite as good quality or something like that. Yeah. And so like with this, it's like that baiting you of like, you know, you just relax, like let your guard down. Like, you know, just, yeah, sit down, have a wine. Again, like once you have a wine or two wines, there's like that inebriation and like vulnerability. Yeah. And so, um, yeah, so I think that there's that baiting and then it's like, and then it switches of like, you know, that maybe and maybe it starts with some physical touch or like some sort of like yeah subtle like intimacy that then escalates escalates to trying to instigate like a sexual um you know interaction and that is like the switch you know it's suddenly like oh hang on this isn't just caring for me and us relaxing and whatever it's actually he wants something out of this and if you don't do it I imagine that's when some of these other things that we've talked about come in oh, but you look so hot or, oh, yeah. but we have an amazing connection and why don't you just do it? Just relax. Like, why are you so uptight? <laughs> yeah, just have a little fun. Um, yeah. Like sometimes we've got to break a few rules or like yes. are, you're always doing, being a good girl, like live a mm-hmm. little, all these mm-hmm. things. Um, yeah. Oh my gosh, we could go into so much. Yeah. <laughs> we do have to watch the time. Um, mm. What we're going to do is, you, like, I literally feel like we went through like 2% of all know. these things. Um, so Marty and I are going to be doing a workshop um, in the women's community. Um, I will put all the dates and stuff below, but it's in about two weeks. Uh, so if you do want to be in this workshop, Marty's going to share all the different coercion tactics mm-hmm. that happen. And then we're also with all the other women that have been in affairs, share their experiences, a lot of these things that they hear so that we can become way more aware to this in the out- outside world, mm-hmm. in the affair relationship or in other dating relationships, um, not even dating, but just any relationship. Um, so we'll be going into that. Marty, I just want to quickly like touch on like say one sign um, of a tactic and that is isolation because I think mm. in affair relationships, isolation is so big. Um, mm. Can you just tell us a little bit about that? I would say like off the top of my head with isolation in relation to affairs, there'd be um, like it's already something that's going to be quite isolated because it has to be secret. Yeah. Uh, so like because he doesn't, like he can't have a public relationship with someone when he has a, has a wife. So I imagine that is already something that's even more 
kind of immediate than than in other relationship contexts. So that's already setting off to like a vulnerable start, right? And with isolation in in any relationship, a lot of the time, like obviously it can be physical isolation, like you only see each other in like a private place like yeah. a hotel room for example or something like that um or like in a relationship that's not an affair relationship it might be literally like I've had clients where they lived together in a city and they all had they had friends there and everything and then he convinced her to move to like his home country town or something and she didn't know anyone and all of a sudden his behavior totally changed because she was isolated and he could be more complacent and didn't have to keep up like the facade of being this great great guy right yeah so um so there's like that type of element to it but there's also that isolation from um her support network people that she might go to and draw upon so like in any relationship if you have people that you can talk to about what's going on um like it means you can express complaints or uh, like when you're not sure about it or whatever challenges Yeah. yeah and I think like a lot of people who are trying to establish this kind of like environment where they're you know in control of the situation and of the other person a lot of the time they are trying to discourage you from from going to those the support network or those friends or family members or whoever it is that um that you might be that that might give insights to you about the unhealthiness yeah the unhealthiness of the situation that might kind of try and discourage you from continuing that with him or whatever and yeah. that can look like, um, like just say you've said something to him, like my friends are all like think this is a bad idea and I'm starting to like think that that it's that they're right. Like it's just, you know, this is all just weighing on me so much, like, you know, something like that. Just say you share that with him. It could be that like when you are going to spend time with your girlfriends, like other times it's a bit like, oh, you're hanging out with them, are you? Oh, I don't know. I don't really like such and such. Or like, do you really like them? I don't she know doesn't if they're really that have good back. You. Yeah. And you act more immature when you've been around them. I like I like you better when you've just been around me. Like whatever things again to chip at the self esteem and the self worth. Yeah. Um, that makes I feel like oh to impress him, I need to not be around my friends as much or you yeah. know whatever. So I mean, and I know we're we're basically out of time. There is more that we can say about that for sure. But I think that's what's going to be really great about the workshop is that there's been in this conversation there's like been lots of the different tactics um but what we'll do in the workshop is actually go through them um kind of like from one to nine yeah um, and and yeah talk talk them through in a in a way that's more like um structured yeah, yeah structured and with, with more time yeah I'm uh, super excited and this workshop is going to be invaluable so the links to join um you will in order to join the community um you can book in a call with me on my website I'll put the links below and then once you join the community then you'll have access to all these um amazing calls um so that's with Marty in two weeks um Marty where can we connect with you and listen to more information that you have <laughs> and all of that Yes, cool. So um, yeah, I didn't mention this at the start. So my podcast is called Sex and Consent. So S-E-X-A-N-D-C-O-N-C-E-N-T. Um, and that's on Instagram. So like at Sex and Consent. And it's also on like Spotify and Apple Podcasts. So you can you can search for that podcast um, wherever you get your podcasts. I have a personal Instagram, but um, which is my name, Marty Elizabeth, um, my middle name, but it's it's not that interesting for this type of stuff. So I'd recommend more to my sex and consent um, account on Instagram. Um, I'm just trying to think, yeah, like I have journal articles and things like that if you're in a, in a uni. Um, but other than that, I think the podcast is probably and the Instagram is probably the best places um, to start with. Yeah, and we'll put all those links below um, because your content uh, in this situation is invaluable. So thank you so much for coming on and sharing all your wisdom. I can't wait to dive into this further (laughs) and talk about all the tactics uh, Mm. in our workshop together. Yeah, it's been so, so fascinating to have this conversation. Thanks so much for having me. And I really look forward to like meeting people in the the workshop environment. Yeah, in the community. Awesome. Thank you so much, Marty. Thank you. Bye.